Hello, my name's Kerry Lewis and I'm a member of the MrBruff.com writing team. Today I'm going to look at how to understand and analyse multi-clause sentences. A multi-clause sentence is a complex sentence. It has a main clause and at least one subordinate clause. The main clause makes sense by itself. The first step to understand a multi-clause sentence is to read it slowly. Pause at each comma and take a longer pause with the colons and semicolons. Remember that the writer has deliberately used punctuation to organise his or her ideas into sections, so the punctuation is there to help you. In our first example, the narrator is about to spend the night in a haunted bedroom. After satisfying myself of the fastening of the door, I began to walk round the room. Peering round each article of furniture, tucking up the valances of the bed and opening its curtains wide. Once you've read the sentence, look for the main clause because this is what the sentence is about. I began to walk round the room, makes sense by itself, so it's the main clause. The other clauses are subordinate or dependent clauses because they don't make sense by themselves and they need the main clause for us to understand them. Here's a summary of common ways to start subordinate clauses. With a subordinating conjunction, for example, because, after, although, with a relative pronoun like which, who or that, or with a non-finite verb that stays the same no matter what the words are around it. For example, the present participle, the ing form of a verb, which we have here. The past participle, say I have, and then the form of the verb that follows is the past participle. Or the infinitive, to walk, to sit, to stand. When you've found the main clause, look at where it is in the sentence. Is it first, last, or, as with this example, in the middle? Be careful, some writers will split a main clause and drop a subordinate clause inside it. Think about the effect that the writer's trying to achieve. Here, the writer uses the first subordinate clause to establish a sequence of actions. First, the writer fastened the door, then he began to walk round the room. This suggests that he's feeling uneasy, and this idea is developed through the use of the present participle with peering, tucking and opening, these are all action words and they quicken the pace and suggest that he's afraid. Let's look at some more examples. Here we have a summary of steps to understanding how to understand a sentence. Number one, read the sentence, pausing at the commas and taking longer pauses with colons and semicolons. Number two, find the main clause. Finally, number three, Look at where the author has positioned the main and subordinate clauses. What effect is he or she trying to create? My next sentence is from Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Mrs Fairfax, the housekeeper, is showing the newly arrived Jane around Thornfield Hall. Jane goes down a narrow staircase and she stops to look down a long passage. Step one. Read the sentence using the punctuation to help you. I lingered in the long passage to which this led, separating the front and back rooms of the third story. Narrow, low and dim, with only one little window at the far end, and looking with its two rows of small black doors all shut, like a corridor in some Bluebeard's castle. Bluebeard is a character in a fairy story whose wives mysteriously vanished. Step 2. Find the main clause. Here it is, at the beginning. Bronte deliberately positions it first because the subordinate clauses that follow mirror Jane taking in her surroundings one detail at a time. The pace is quite slow. I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but the reference to Bluebeard at the end has been deliberately placed there because it is important. Let's look at another example now. In our next example, Scrooge meets the ghost of Christmas present. Step 1. Read the sentence, pausing at the commas. Now, we've got quite a lot of commas here to separate items in a list. It's an overwhelming list, deliberately written to create a mood of excitement, so I'll speed up when I get to it. Heaped upon the floor, to form a kind of throne, were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red-hot chestnuts, cherry-cheeked apples, 
juicy oranges, luscious pears, immense twelve cakes and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. Step two, look for the main claws, and as we can see, it's in red and incredibly long. Dickens has split it and dropped in the first subordinate claws. This embedded subordinate clause is separated with commas, and with the main clause, Dickens deliberately uses listing to show how much food there is. Step three is to look at where the clauses are placed. The first subordinate clause, to form a kind of throne, as we've seen, is embedded. This provides information about the food before we read the list. Dickens wants us, as we read, to imagine the food heaped upon the floor, forming a throne. The subordinate clause at the end appeals to the sense of sight and the sense of taste. The food is tempting and Dickens wants the reader to enjoy this imagery. Our final example is non-fiction and it's from the Hawaiian archipelago by Isabella L. Bird. Isabella Bird was a 19th century explorer, writer and photographer. She was the first woman to be elected Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. In this extract, she describes the experience of standing on a ledge near a volcano. She describes what she sees below her in a fissure, which is an opening in the ground. Step one, read the sentence, pausing at the punctuation. Burned, singed, stifled, blinded, only able to stand on one foot at a time, jumping back across the fissure every two or three minutes to escape an unendurable whiff of heat and sulphurous stench, or when spitting sounds below threatened the disruption of the ledge. Lured as often back by the fascination of the horrors below. So we spent three hours. So means in this manner or in this way. In other words, in this way we spent three hours. Bird has deliberately placed the main clause last. The subordinate clauses being first suggest simultaneous actions, in other words, lots of things happening at the same time. They build a fast pace at the same time that the speaker and her companion are jumping backwards and forwards over the ledge. The volcano is making splitting sounds. They're keenly aware that it might destroy the ledge, but they still keep looking down because they're fascinated by what they see. Let's look now at how we might begin to analyse a multi-clause sentence if you're writing about it in an exam or in an essay. First of all, here's some advice. Don't copy the whole sentence because some multi-clause sentences are very, very long. It's likely that you'd only be analysing a few words from a sentence anyway, so it's not an effective use of your time. Instead, introduce the sentence and only copy the words that you're going to analyse. Remember that structural features often draw attention to language features, so we need to analyse those at the same time. Here's an example analysis of the previous extract from Isabella Bird's journal. I'm going to make my point. The writer deliberately uses a multi-clause sentence positioning the subordinate clauses at the beginning to quicken the pace and emphasise the simultaneous actions of the people and the volcano. I'm now going to give my evidence and use some terminology. The listing of the past participles, burned, singed, stifled, blinded, emphasises the danger as well as the physical consequences of people's actions. Now I'm going to zoom in on particular words. These words, deliberately positioned at the beginning of the sentence, connote hell, leading the reader to wonder why the speaker and her friend would voluntarily subject themselves to a painful experience in which their senses are assaulted. And here, of course, when I reference the reader, I'm talking about the impact on you, the reader. I've written the word furthermore because if I were to continue this analysis, I'd pick out more words and phrases. I might talk, for example, about how the subordinate clause that begins with the word jumping introduces the theme of time. Every two or three minutes quickens the pace, emphasising the danger they're in. I might also analyse imagery to do with hell, for example, the heat and sulphurous stench. We also have alliteration with sulphurous stench, and this indicates that the senses have been completely overwhelmed. Furthermore, we associate sulphur with hell, 
So this is a development of that imagery. We might analyse how the writer develops a mood of danger through the sense of sound. The alliteration is continued with splitting sounds. This literally describes the rocks being split into pieces and draws attention to the power of the active volcano and the danger she's in. You could also talk about the subordinate clause, which begins with the word Lord. This reveals that even though there are horrors below, Bird and her companion are still fascinated by what they see. The positioning of the subordinate clauses, therefore, emphasises the fast pace and simultaneous actions, heightening the danger they're in. It's therefore surprising when we learn, in the main clause, right at the very end, that they spent three hours placing their lives at risk. It must have been an incredibly amazing and exhilarating experience for them, even though they were placing their lives at risk. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to buy a copy of Mr Brough's Guide to Grammar, I've put a link in the description below. In the meantime, please like, subscribe and share, and I'll see you in the next video.